，谢谢上百万数学爱好者关注 Three Blue One Brown 频道。Do you have any textbook recommendations? I do. I mean, obviously, this is something that depends on what you're trying to learn and you know what you're looking for in a given textbook. But a couple that I'm personally pretty fond of, I've got over here.、Um, so the first one is something I wish I had had when I was learning things in college in my freshman year, when you learn about multivariable calculus and linear algebra and things like that. So it's called vector algebra, no, vector calculus, linear algebra, and differential forms, a unified approach. And it's by、uh, John Hubbard and Barbara Hubbard, so sort of a husband-wife pair, which is cute. I think where it succeeds that a lot of other books about similar topics fail is that it does a really good job showing why you're making certain constructions, but also going into the depth of it. So it's not just an engineering book in that you're just talking about how to apply linear algebra. It really is meant for math people and math majors. But at the same time, it doesn't stay too abstract. It actually shows you how to compute things, shows you where they'll be applied. And it goes pretty deep. It gets up to where you can describe Maxwell's equations with differential forms. But even if you're not learning about differential forms and things like that, just as a linear algebra textbook,、uh, just the one third of it that is that, I would pretty highly recommend.、Um, another, which is just a total classic, it would be a shame not to mention this, is Stephen Strogatz's Nonlinear Dynamics and Chaos. Talk to anybody who's read this book, and I can almost guarantee it'll be one of their favorite textbooks. It is filled with actual applications to chemistry and biology and things like that, but again, without shying away from the depth of the math. Stephen Strogatz is, of course, very skilled as a communicator. He's quite well known for that at this point, and it shows in his writings. And this is something that's meant for students taking a class. It's not a popular math book, but it almost reads like a popular math book at certain points in terms of how approachable it can be. Another one which I've got here is. Not really a textbook per se, but、uh, you could treat it that way if you wanted to think of I don't know if there was a course about clever proofs out there. This should probably be one of the texts in there, but it's called Proofs from the Book, which is an allusion to a certain quote from Paul Erdős where he was talking about how there's some proofs out there. Now, what did he say? He said you don't have to believe in God, but you do have to believe in the book. And there's some proofs out there with it. When you read them, you realize that they came from the book. And even if it's a little bit silly to talk about, you know, there being the best proof for something or something that is almost、mm, deified in terms of its perfection, what they tried to do with this was compile a list of some of the proofs out there that could be considered to come from the book. And they're really clever. It's really pleasing. And while it covers all sorts of different topics, there is a little bit of a bent towards discrete math and graph theory. So if you're into those kinds of things, it's just filled with really nice examples. And the other one I've got here, also not really like a textbook in the sense that I could imagine this being assigned in a class.、Uh, it's just sort of weirder. It's almost a genre of its own. Is the Koshi Schwartz Master Class? So as you may well know, the idea of a master class is something where usually in the arts, if you have someone who's striving towards excellence in that field, maybe you're a violin player and you're really striving towards excellence, a master class would be something where you've really worked up a particular skill set and maybe a particular piece, and you get extremely pointed. Advice and criticism from a given expert, and the idea of framing math in that way, I think, is kind of—I don't know—it's thought-provoking.、Uh, but this is a really good foundation for analysis, but the kind of problem-solving that goes into analysis, and not just learning certain inequalities like Cauchy-Schwarz or the arithmetic mean geometric mean, or leveraging convexity in clever ways. Rather than just telling you what they are, it really tries to give you this sense of how you can use them to solve problems or build those instincts for how you use them to solve problems. And that's just four. There's countless different textbooks I could recommend, but sometimes too many recommendations tend to water down the ones that you have given. How do you avoid being frustrated by mathematical textbooks? How do you read math texts faster? I think this is a question a lot of us can resonate with because we all know that feeling when you're reading a textbook and or, pa or paper, whatever it is, and you find yourself going over the same page maybe seven different times, and you're kind of squinting your eyes and banging your head against it, and whatever it's saying is just not sinking in. So definitely, if that's the case, the, the correct thing to do is to not try to read that page an eighth time. Something else is going wrong. And one possibility is that it's just not an author that you resonate with. There might be another book about the same topic written by someone who you do resonate with. So taking the time to explore which different、um, approaches to a topic seem to match with you, I think, can be important. So, for example, I really enjoy anything that Vladimir Arnold has written. If I see that there's a given topic, you know, there's multiple books on classical mechanics, and I see that Arnold has written one, 
I'm probably going to resonate with that in a certain way. So that might be what I go to first to get an instinct for it. Another possibility, though, if you're at that point when you're banging your head against it, is that there's a hidden prerequisite. There is something that the author is assuming. It's not entirely clear that they are assuming that. So one example here would be um, a lot of modern math texts assume that you're familiar with set theory, or rather they assume that you're familiar with the language of set theory and some of the, I don't know, instincts that come about from cardinality and things like that. And if that's something you're uncomfortable with, or if some of the language doesn't make sense, you would find yourself just banging your head against that wall many times. Another common one for people who are just starting college is the whole premise of how certain math fields are constructed, where you start off with axioms and you're constructing lemmas and theorems, and that those are ultimately going to be used for solving problems like five chapters down the road, and you kind of swallow this pill of abstraction in order to get to that reward later. Because what it means is if you are thinking of it like a high school textbook, you know, something like a calculus book that's telling you how to solve a problem then and there and putting off the formalisms until later, it makes it really confusing to just plow through those axioms and not necessarily understand why or where they come from. And if you are in that kind of headbanging state on a given page, one thing I might suggest is looking up lectures on that particular topic. Math can sometimes be much more of an oral tradition than we give it credit for. And just hearing someone talk about certain topics and what they choose to emphasize or when they brush aside something and say, oh, this isn't really important, that's just details, but the core of this proof comes from here. All of that information sometimes gets communicated in the way that it's spoken in a lecture rather than any way that it's written. A good textbook author can write it that way, but it tends to come through in lectures a little bit more easily sometimes. How can I tell whether I am not gifted enough or if it's just that a textbook is poorly written? Uh, okay, so a couple things to unpack there. I mean, first of all, it is the case that some textbooks are poorly written, so when you're confused, you're not exactly to blame. But the whole premise of it being a matter of being gifted or not gifted, that I would try to put out of your head and say, what's relevant for understanding math is if you have experience with it or not. And when you look at the people around you where some seem to be really good at it, just they get it much more quickly, and it comes across almost like they have this innate genetic advantage for math, Almost always it's because they have just a deeper set of experience, more hours spent contemplating the relative kinds of problems associated with that. And it's not a matter of something innate that if you don't have it, then you're not able to get ever. And anytime these sort of nature versus nurture discussions come about over whether mathematical talent is something that is learned over time, or if there's something that's inbuilt in certain people that gives them an advantage, you know, people will bring in these examples like uh, John von Neumann or Terence Tao, where it seems like some people really do start off with a different kind of advantage or their brain really seems to work in a different way. And maybe those are actual exceptions. Maybe there is some innateness. I can't say for sure. But by and large, to a first order or even second order approximation, if you assume everything is based on the history that you have with the subject, then when you're asking a question like this on, am I gifted enough for this textbook or is it, uh, you know, is it poorly written? Instead, I would try to frame it as, do I have the preparation needed for it? Have I learned some of those hidden prerequisites that are in here? Or when one of my peers seems to be going really quickly with it, what, what is their history exactly? Did they do a lot of contest math and they're solving problems more quickly? Uh, did they take a course that you didn't take? Do they go to the office hours of the professor a little bit more and get some of those subtler cues that come from in-person discussions that don't come out through the text? If you really banish the idea of that person being gifted and instead think of it as them being prepared, then you can actually do something about it. You can try to match that preparation. When you make videos, do you talk about topics that you're already most familiar with or do you pick a topic and then learn more about it? Uh, you know, it depends. I would say that the process for making a video is not so much that I start and say, now what will the topic be? And then begin researching it or drawing on knowledge that I already had. Instead, the research phase is something that's much more ambient. I just try to learn math, you know, reading in the mornings and the evenings and things like that in a way that's not necessarily targeted towards videos, but in the back of my mind, I'm kind of keeping notes on what might be a good video topic. And if something does seem like it's there and I learn it a little bit more and I feel like there's a good angle on it, then maybe, you know, a year later, I end up getting to that particular topic and I've built up somewhat of a history with it by that point. So in that sense, by the time I'm making a video on something, it's usually something I have a decent history with. I, I honestly can't think of any times that I've just started to make a video and, and began the research at that point. Like if right now I was going to sit down and say, I want to talk about uh, fluid mechanics or something I'm not too familiar with the intimate details of, 
I, I suspect that just wouldn't be a great video or there's other people who are going to make a better version of that video. What's the story behind how the pie creatures were created? Okay, so uh, very early on, I think one of the first videos that went on the channel, I was talking about a proof of Euler's formula, the V minus E plus F equals two. Actually, it was a proof. Book over here. Um, it was a proof that I first saw in this book. Um, it was really clever. I really loved the approach that it took. Uh, and the whole idea involved thinking of the spanning tree of a planar graph. So you've got some kind of graph you can draw in the plane and you want to have um, a set of edges such that if you start from any one node, you're able to walk to any of those other edges. And it's kind of a natural thing to literally talk about walking and stepping across it. But in particular, I wanted some notion of a character in this world because uh, it also talks about, the, the proof also talks about a dual graph where you think of the faces that this planar graph cuts the plane into as nodes of a different graph, a different structure that has some notion of connection. And the connection between faces are just also the edges of the graph. And the whole proof comes down to thinking of a spanning tree in the original graph and a spanning tree in the dual graph. And so I wanted something where you have one kind of character in one world walking on the normal nodes and then another character in the other walking on these dual nodes to give it a certain, I don't know, a visceral sense of the back and forth. And I think because the animations were so primitive at that time and the only real things that I was drawing were just geometric shapes or mathematical symbols, I don't know, I think I was just looking at mathematical symbols and thinking which one of these could actually walk along a graph and the pi symbol just has some legs. And the original designs were pretty janky. Uh, if I look back at the old pie creatures, it's a little bit jarring in contrast uh, to what I ended up designing later on. But it was clear then that there was a value to having some sort of quirky and kind of cute character um, in these math lessons. Because I do think actually having character in some capacity expressing emotion in response to mathematical results is pedagogically beneficial. It's not just good for the you know entertainment aspect of it but to emphasize which results are actually important or when it's okay to be confused and all of this sort of thing. Having some kind of emotive character matters. I actually wish that math papers um, and math textbooks were written where you have some kind of emoji or at least an emotive character responding to the things going on in the margins and emphasizing that more uh, expressive quality that the thing that comes across in lectures but doesn't come across in textbooks often. I think you could actually communicate some of that subtlety if people would just draw little cartoons in the margins now and then. What made you develop the Manum package, and how do you feel about Manum being used by more people? Well, originally, it was just a coding project. I mean, the channel didn't even exist, and I was just looking for something to do that was, uh, I don't know, a playful creation of my own in the vein of creating math illustrations. And in particular, I think I was a little frustrated by how a lot of default math illustration software uh, centers on graphing and the idea of representing a function as a graph. And I was thinking, you know, there's a lot of other ways that we represent functions. You could talk about a domain coloring or a vector field, or in particular, like transformations, letting movement over time indicate what the connection between inputs and outputs is. And there were a couple topics I wanted to explain or given talks or tutoring sessions and things like that, which lent themselves to a description in terms of transformations, things like complex analysis, or the very first video that I did was about um, kind of thinking of e to the pi i in terms of group theory and translations between an additive action of sliding and a multiplicative action of stretching and rotating. All of that stuff really lends itself to non-graphical understandings of functions. So I think maybe that was in the back of my mind. You know, like a lot of people out there who make math illustrations, having something that was just my own and built as my own thing it's kind of irrational on the one hand because there's so many other tools that do things really well. I could have engaged with the Python plugins to Blender or just built it all on Mathematica or something. But there is a benefit once you know how everything works for yourself that you can just create new stuff um, and you have that kind of ownership to tear up the guts of it and make the new thing that you want. So you're not limited by the constraints of the tool. So for me, the advantage of Manum um, usually has nothing to do with what it's capable of doing in a given moment, but it's instead my own relationship with it is such that if I need a new thing created, you know, the first time I was ever making a video about a fractal to write stuff that lets it make fractals, or I don't know, when I was doing the Fourier series animations and I wanted a particular style for how the rotating vectors would look and kind of zooming in and having a camera pan to follow it. All of that is where I have the most fun, when I'm creating something new for a particular video and being able to dig into the guts of a tool because I built it and I know how everything works in it, that's sort of where I find the advantage. Um, and to the second part of the question about how do I feel about Manum being used by more people, 
I mean, kind of mixed, to be honest. I, I think it's awesome if people can find it useful. And there is a smile that's brought to my face when I see people make incredible things. There's a YouTube channel called Reducible who makes some really great videos. Uh, VCubingX also does so with it. You know, I've seen Manum show up in Veritasium and that sort of brought a smile to my face. I was looking through Bilibili and noticed a, a good number of Manum videos there. So one that uh, kind of built on top of it to do data visualizations and had an extension of the package that sort of caught my eye. But in all of these cases, it's a little bit funny because the, the thing I was just talking about where my own relationship with it is the advantage that I find where because it's something that I built, it's something that I feel I can extend very seamlessly. You know, if someone else is playing with it, I, I sometimes worry that it's just a worse version of some other tools out there. Now, to be fair, that has changed a lot thanks to the Manum community. So there's people who took what I wrote and tried to make it a lot more user-friendly, and I think succeeded in that. And, you know, it's getting better every day. Um, these days, they're incorporating some of the OpenGL stuff that I wrote into my version into theirs. So soon it should just be strictly better um, in addition to being easier to work with. And yeah, when people use that to make stuff that feels like it needed a programmatic animation, you know, it leverages loops and abstraction in some way, it makes me pretty happy. Where I get a little bit worried is if I see people use it in a way that feels like you really didn't need programmatic animations. And I'm a total hypocrite here because given that I do pretty much all of my stuff in Manum, that means that there's a number of scenes that probably didn't need to be made in it, but I was just in the middle of a workflow where I was in Manum anyway because of some other illustrations I was doing. So if it's just manipulating text on screen, it's like, I might as well just do it with this. But if I see someone else use it only for that, only to like write equations and manipulate it, I, I don't know. I, I kind of feel like they should make sure they've explored the full space of tools before they dive into that one in particular. How do you train problem solving skills? Well, you know, the cliched answer, and it's just absolutely true, is there's no substitute for practice. Uh, you know, mathematics is not a spectator sport. I think it was Polya who wrote that. And in fact, actually, Polya has a book. Um, how to Solve It, which, you know, it's a pretty good book about problem solving if you're looking for texts on that. I'm also quite fond of, um, I don't have it on my shelf here, but Terence Tao has a book, which I think he wrote when he was like 15 years old about problem solving. It's something like mathematical problem solving, a personal perspective. That one I think is really great. Or the art of problem solving textbooks. Those ones are also the original books. Those ones are, are especially good. But, you know, just reading the books is, is never really going to do it for you. You have to be solving problems yourself. Contest math can give you a pretty good bank of problems to work with. Uh, spend lots of time on them. Don't feel like you're constrained by the time constraints that usual contests will give in that. I'm not sure what it looks like in China, but in the American system, there's the AMC, which, you know, you have like 75 minutes to do 25 questions. But some of these questions you could easily spend a day pondering on. But one thing I might say is, in addition to just solving the problems and doing practice, leave yourself room to reflect on why certain solutions work or when you aren't able to solve something and you read a solution, don't just read it and see if you understand it. Try to step back and say, okay, what was the instinct that I didn't have that I could have potentially had that would lead me to that solution? Um, so one example that comes to mind here, this is, it's kind of a silly question. It's not a hard question at all, but I remember when I was uh, in early high school and I was going to these math circle events at the University of Utah, and in one session, one of the problems we were given, uh, let me see if I remember it right. You have some number of different rooms, so an arbitrary number of rooms, and each has a certain number of people. And then every minute, one person is going to walk from one room to another. But the constraint is that they have to walk to a room that had at most as many people as where they came from. So you can only go from, you know, a room with a lot of people. No, no, the other way. You can go from a room with a small number of people to a large number of people. Or the one that you're walking to has to have at least as many people as the one that you started in. Yeah, that's it. And the, the question is if you can prove that no matter what, after a finite number of minutes, a finite number of moves that have this constraint, everyone will end up in the same room. And, you know, it wasn't so much a matter of this being an especially challenging problem. The, the spirit of that lesson was to try to find a really tight way to rigorously capture the fact that this thing will be true, that this end condition must happen. And you have this vague instinct when you think about it that, okay, if you have to go from a smaller room to a bigger room, then all the smaller rooms are eventually going to drain out and everything's just going to get concentrated to the big rooms. And at the extreme, everyone's just in one big room. But the question is, how do you actually, you know, make that rigorous? How do you describe it in an airtight proof? 
And the cleverest solution um, that really struck me and it kind of stuck with me thereafter, I forget even who came up with it in that session, but the idea was to look at the sum of the squares of the number of people in each room. So you maybe have a hundred rooms and you look at x1 squared plus x2 squared on and on up to x100 squared where x sub i is the number of people in room i. And you say under this condition, that sum always increases. Because basically if someone goes from a smaller room to a bigger one, let's say x sub j to x sub i, and x sub j is smaller than x sub i, and then you compare what is the sum of their squares before, and then what is the sum of their squares after, when you've subtracted one from x sub j and you've added one to x sub i, you can see that as long as x sub i is bigger than x sub j, you expand this all out and one looks bigger. All you have to say in the proof is that this sum of the squares strictly increases. It also has a maximum for what it could possibly be. You know, there's only so many people. So the maximum it could possibly be is the square of that number of people. And if with each one of these moves, it strictly increases, eventually it'll get to that maximum state. And I don't know, maybe it's this overkill solution for that problem, but it seemed so out of left field to me that I was just left pondering it while I was going home after that session. And I think kind of the key of that particular problem is thinking about the convexity of x squared and the idea that uh, x squared is a really nice way to capture, I don't know, the separation between things. So when you have this loose instinct that the number of people in each room um, is going to get farther and farther apart, it, uh, you know, the smaller rooms get smaller, the bigger rooms get bigger, that when you want to quantify that in some way, thinking to do this sum over the squares uh, I think that actually maps to, you know, like the basis of statistics and how we define variance and um, all sorts of other places where you see the x squared function that seems like it was just arbitrarily thrown in as something that seems kind of nice with a smooth minimum. Um, and I don't know, maybe that's a silly example, but little things like that where letting yourself really ponder why a solution worked or why it is that you didn't come up with something that seemed really clever and out of the blue letting that be mixed in with the practice seems pretty important to me. How much should visuals really be used in math, and when are they not applicable or not preferred? You know, that's such a good question, because I sometimes think that, you know, people will, people love visual intuition so much that sometimes they think in order to understand it, they have to be able to visualize it. And, you know, I'm definitely in the camp where if I can visualize it, I, I think that's the most satisfying way sometimes. But you know, there's a couple problems with this. One is that you can halt your learning because sometimes something is hard to visualize. And rather than just moving past it with the logical symbolic understanding of why it works and then seeing what you can get from there that might help inform, you know, a deeper understanding later, you're just stuck at that wall and you're, you're not able to move past. But also not all visual explanations actually match the logic. So as an example, let's say you were trying to describe what is continuity to someone. You know, one kind of visual answer to this thing is to say, uh, you know, you can draw the line, you can draw the graph of the function and never have to lift up your pencil. It's like, okay, that, that is kind of an instinct for it, but that doesn't really reflect the logic and the cleverness for how we end up defining continuity with epsilons and deltas. Now you can also give a visual explanation of the epsilon delta stuff. You can say, okay, how do we capture this idea of a discontinuous jump? and say just at that point of jumping, if you wanted to constrain how far away the outputs are for a small range of inputs, evidently at that point of jumping, there's a minimum to how close you can guarantee those outputs are to each other. And using that as the beginning, and maybe you are drawing circles and having something on the blackboard as you're starting to describe that, um, can help visually understand the logic of it. But it's a very different kind of visual understanding than just saying, it's a curve you can draw where you don't lift up your pencil. So I do think sometimes it's important to recognize whether a given, you know, visual understanding is actually just a vague instinct that's pretty disconnected from the logic, or if it's uh, reflecting the logic itself, and it's trying to directly implement what the rigorous definitions are doing with a particular example that you happen to be able to draw. And another risk is also that visuals sometimes give the illusion of understanding when very little has actually been explained. Uh, there's this one GIF that I'm thinking of that, you know, ostensibly shows why the surface area of a sphere is what it is, and it kind of unpeels that surface area and squishes it all into a sine graph and shows some integrals. I, I really think nothing about that is helpful for understanding the surface area and to actually sit down and parse, like, you know, why the shape of the graph that comes up is what it is, uh, is totally, totally missing from this GIF 
But, you know, at the same time, I've seen it get just a huge number of points on Reddit for people who, I don't know what they're getting out of it. Maybe it's just the prettiness of it. Uh, maybe it is that illusion of understanding. But that's a big risk. Probability series when? Shiatsu eating. Shiatsu eating. <laughs>